Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, a work with um, uh, my colleague Jack, and this is about uh, data streaming algorithms, in particular matchings and vertex cover problems. And please, uh, yeah, please interrupt me at any moment and ask any questions whenever you like. So um, it almost feels like this slide is absolutely unnecessary when I present this to, to you. So I know that I'm, I'm sure that everyone is aware of what the data streaming model is. Um, so uh, we're working um, with data streams, that is, uh, so a streaming algorithm is characterized by uh, sequential access. So in general, um, what we're interested in is uh, designing data streaming algorithms that compute some sort of function um, having only sequential access. So this, the algorithm sees the items really one by one, item by item. And while we go over this stream, the goal is to compute some function. However, we want to minimize the uh, random access memory that our algorithm uses. So um, th these should be, so our focus is on space here. Now, um, this is a well-established model. Um, in at least since 25 years, there, there are many, many results on data streaming algorithms. They are inspired by massive data sets, massive data sets and um, yeah, it is a very popular model these days and with many, many uh, very interesting recent results. Um, so the key uh, problems usually studied traditionally were um, sort of more statistical type of problems. So uh, can we, for example, approximate the number of distinct elements? Can we compute the most frequent elements in a data stream using small space? Maybe uh, what can we compute the frequency moments, et cetera. But um, what we're um, discussing in this talk are graph streams. So we want streaming algorithms for graphs. Um, just one second, I can see that Zoom uh, puts on my desk here some, you know, there's this control panel on the top, which is basically uh, going over my slides. So I'm just having a, oh yeah, good. I can, can sort of remove it, I guess. Good. Okay, so um, we're talking in this talk about data streaming algorithm for graphs for graph problems. So um, uh, graph problems in the data streaming model have been studied since roughly 20 years. And there's a specific model, the insertion only model, which is sort of mostly studied in this model. So um, in this model, we see the edges of a graph to arrive one by one. Now this is a sequence of edges can be in arbitrary order. So here we have a little graph and uh, these edges just arrive one by one, the algorithm sees them one by one. Now uh, the objective is to design an algorithm that basically goes over the sequence of edges and in the end also outputs some kind of result. The goal again is to have, uh, to minimize the space usage. Now we see that in insertion only streams, um, if the edges just arrive one by one and that's it, then um, uh, yeah, a very dense graph might have up to n square edges. So, uh, you know, a priori uh, having algorithms that use space little o of n square is already non-trivial. At least it's not always clear, you know, at least for very, very dense graphs, how to sort of design such algorithms. So, but we see that since the uh, input stream is of length at most n square, so little o of n square might be non-trivial already. Now, this model has received a lot of attention with plenty of uh, works addressing this model for matchings, independent sets, all kind of sort of your favorite graph problem most likely has been uh, studied in the insertion only model. Um, but then, uh, so what this talk is about is more about the insertion uh, deletion model. So we not only have now edge insertions, but we also have edge deletions. So that is um, now our input sequence is not only, so we don't not only see edges as they're being inserted, but also deleted. So for example, here in this picture, we have uh, um, an input um, that basically describes the same uh, graph as in the insertion only example up here. The only difference is that um, this input stream inserts some edges and deletes them later on. So for example, E5 is inserted and deleted and then later on inserted again and deleted again. And uh, Having these deletions makes that the input stream can be basically arbitrarily long. So we might have now, you know, you can play this game of inserting and deleting edges over and over again. So the input stream is not anymore really bounded in length here. Um, now, uh, there are much fewer results on the insertion deletion model than on the insertion only model. And it's generally these de dealing with these deletions is not always easy. But the goal is uh, similar. Again, we want algorithms with space little o of n square when we process these streams. Okay, now um, 
the, the main problem that we will focus on here are, uh, is the graph matching problem. So we're interested in computing matchings. Again, uh, just to quickly recap what, what matchings are and what the problem is that we study. So um, if we are given a graph, then a matching is just a subset of vertex disjoint edges. So the red edge here, that would form a matching in this graph on, uh, on this path of four vertices. Now, of course, that's not a matching because this vertex here would be matched twice, basically. That's not allowed. Um, we have a maximal matching if, uh, um, if you can't enlarge the size of a matching simply by adding an, uh, an edge outside the matching to it. So if we, we can't really add this edge and this edge to the matching because this would uh, then lead to a structure that's not a matching anymore. And a maximum matching is then one of largest size. Now, um, the problem more formally, uh, our, the goal will be um, to approximate the maximum matching problem. That is, we want to output a matching such that uh, C times the size of this matching is at least as large as uh, a, ma a maximum matching. That means C is the approximation factor. And in particular, the approximation factor here, we will uh, consider it to be larger than one. And uh, there's this important property. We know that every maximum matching is at least of size one half times the size of a maximum matching. Now, um, if we go to the streaming model, so how can we then compute matchings in the streaming model? Now, um, the first and perhaps the most natural approach to doing that is um, if we look at uh, the simple greedy, greedy matching algorithm. That is, so we start out with an empty matching. Then if you go through the set of edges of the input graph in arbitrary order, and if you look at the current edge and you try to just insert it into the matching if you can, that is if uh, M union, uh, this edge E is still a matching, then you just do that. Basically, um, basically probe every edge in the input graph and insert it into your matching. Now that's, that's a really you know, simple algorithm. And um, if we analyze it, you see right, rather quickly that the matching produced by greed is a maximal matching. And therefore this is a two approximation for maximum matching. And not only that, so the reason this is uh, you know, really useful for the data streaming model is that um, in the insertion only model where we don't have deletions, but we just see an arbitrary sequence of the edges, we can just run the greedy algorithm. We see the first edge, the second edge, et cetera. Greedy just tries to put these edges into the matching. So this uh, produces a two approximation. Now, interestingly, this is also a sublinear space algorithm, right? Or it can be a sublinear space algorithm if the input graph is dense enough. So the space that is used is simply the size of the matching. So we put edges into a matching. If you account the log factor for you know, writing down every edge, like writing the identifiers down, something like that, then the space is basically size of the matching log n, which is at most n log n. So that's, that's very nice. So in the insertion only model, um, we have a constant factor approximation with a space, which is roughly n log n. Now, um, we would really uh, now want to go to the insertion deletion model. So um, let's see what we can do if we have um, deletions. So uh, if we have deletions, then um, clearly the main question is how can we handle these deletions? Clearly, um, if we just attempt the following, suppose we run the greedy algorithm. I mean, um, an edge arrives, we put it in a matching, that's great, but the edge might be deleted later on. And in the meantime, maybe this edge has blocked other edges from being inserted. So this really leads to a lot of problems. So greedy um, clearly fails, but not only that, it's, you can even argue that essentially any deterministic algorithm um, will necessarily fail because um, you know, it is even possible to prove a lower bound showing that even if your task is only to output an edge from the input stream in a, um, with a deterministic algorithm, then you will not, you basically can't achieve this with high probability in a, a or you know, with, with, uh, with certainty to output an edge from the input stream. So deterministic algorithms are in general not very well suited when you need to output edges in insertion deletion streams. So what else is there then? Um, now the main tool in general for processing insertion deletion streams uh, are linear sketches. So um, I'm not gonna go into a, you know, a, a very precise definition, but just to give you an idea how this would work, so uh, first of all, we see that essentially all insertion deletion streaming algorithms rely on the computation of linear sketches. So this holds for essentially most of, most of the interesting algorithms published. Now, um, 
A linear sketch, uh, you can think of it as follows. So we have an input stream here of length n, and the goal would be to compute some sort of sketch function on this entire input stream. But the reason why linear sketches are so well suited for data streams is essentially, well, exactly they're linear. So what we can do is we can um, combine partial sketches. So we can sort of compute the, the sketch function on the first item. And uh, you know, by linearity, we know that if we combine these two sketches of the first item and of all the rest, then we uh, get the same as the, initial, as the big sketch for the entire stream. And using linearity, you can basically just uh, take the incoming item, compute the sketch of it and combine it what you've already sort of computed previously. So linear sketches, there's this linearity property is really you know, really great for data streaming computation. In particular, Christian, can we see very quickly why the greedy is a linear sketch? Oh, greedy is not a linear sketch. Ah, sorry. No, no, no. But there is a great linear sketch that we can use, and um, that will be uh, uh, the technique is called L zero sampling. So L zero sampling is the following task. So suppose I give you um, an n-dimensional vector x then L0 sampling consists of outputting from this or sampling from this uh, vector x, a coordinate basically from the non-zero entries of the vector. So if our vector is um, as this one that I've written down here, then an L0 sampler would output um, a coordinate from the non-zero entries, which is either one, two, or five. And uh, L0 sampling, so this should happen with, uh, you know, it should output a uniform random coordinate. So the probability for each of these entries should be one, one third. And uh, why this is very useful is that uh, you can implement L0 sampling in insertion deletion streams uh, with a, a sketch size, which is only polylog n. So there are small space algorithms that basically allow you to implement L0 sampling in um, insertion deletion streams. Now, the reason this is useful for processing graph streams or insertion deletion graph streams is um, as follows. So an insertion deletion graph stream ultimately only describes a vector in zero one to the n choose two. So if we um, essentially pick, we might have uh, in our n vertex graph, there are n choose two edges at most. So a vector zero one vector of this dimension would precisely describe which edges are present and which edges are not present. Um, so if we run now an L0 sampler on such an insertion deletion graph stream, then the L0 sampler yields us a uniform random edge in the input graph, because again, it samples a non-zero coordinate, uh, sorry, a coordinate from the non-zero entries. So in this vector, non-zero entry corresponds to an edge. So we would get a uniform random edge in the graph. And um, this is sort of the main technique um, for designing insertion deletion graph streaming algorithms. Because, so this is even more useful because we can sort of um, consider substreams as well, of course, of the input stream. So we can um, implement sampling tasks such as sample a random edge incident to a vertex or sample some random edge in some vertex induced subgraph or something similar to that. So we can sort of um, shift the focus, look at a substream and then run an L0 sampler on that. Wait a moment, Christian. Mm -hmm. I'm a bit lost to, to get back on the rails. So. If you have an insertion deletion graph stream, um, so zero means that, okay, I delete an edge and, and one means I, I insert an edge, right? Oh, you would, you would put a minus one if you delete an edge. But, so, but why you say it's, ah, okay. And, and, but the result is a vector that is updated according all, to all these instructions. That's right. So you would start with uh, the all zero vector and now the first edge arrives, and that means um, that that basically corresponds to plus one of one's uh, coordinate in this, you know, in this n choose two dimensional vector. Okay. If you want to delete this edge again, then you basically introduce a minus one, or you add a minus one to the specific. So one. what you say is that in in this uh, sequence of plus and minus one instructions, uh, mm -hmm. if I partition it, for each partition I can uh, compute a linear sketch. And I add them, and I will get the linear sketch of ev of everything. You can do that. That's right. So um, uh, essentially, basically, if you start out. So the way the algorithm would work, um, uh, you run such a sketch, meaning initially your set sort of sketches 
if you want empty or is null. Uh, and then the first edge arrives, you compute the sketch uh, value of this uh, specific edge that came in and you add it to this uh, sketch that you keep in memory or maintain in memory. You can sort of by linearity just add these things together. Do you handle multiple edges too? Can you have two and minus two? That's right. So um, this technique is general enough that you, you might even allow uh, you know, um, edge streams where you first even have some deletions. You might delete an edge three times before you insert it. Um, and, you know, it allows for much more flexibility. But um, the typical assumption is that, uh, first of all, the coordinates of the vector should always be positive because we, we don't really want that we delete uh, edges multiple times before we insert them. And uh, if they're positive, often you want them that, you know, the multiplicities are maybe not too large. So here I only put that the vector that's uh, in zero one as, as only zero one coordinates because I didn't want to consider multigraphs, but you can do that as well. There, are, everything still holds if we allow uh, multi edges as well. Sorry, but we still need to apply some kind of a non-trivial sketching function on this state vector, right? Just to, to compress its size, not to be open squared, right? The sketching function itself will be, you know, is is in to some degree a non-trivial non function if you if you want. You know, the sketch will never exceed the size. Like uh, maybe think about it. I mean, I don't want to say that's potentially simplified what I'm saying, but uh, an edge arrives and you compute a sketch which might be of, of size, uh, say log square n, something like that. But then in memory already holds sort of the combined sketch of what you've seen so far, which is also of size uh, log square n. And then you just combine these two by some you know, combination function that uh, um, yields as well a, a, a final sketch of size log square n. So you can sort of combine everything together into size, compress it into size log square n roughly. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, good. And then, yeah, once you're done with the sketch function at the very end of the stream, you can sort of uh, uh, ask the, the sketch or you have another sort of, uh, if you want a function, that produces from the sketch a uniform random edge. Okay, um, now um, what can you do with that? So for matching, what you can do is the following. So um, you can use these techniques um, and you can come up with a um, streaming algorithm for insertion deletion streams that produces an n to the two minus three epsilon space um, algorithm. However, um, the approximation factor of that for matching is n to the epsilon. So, so what does this mean? We see really that the approximation factor in, uh, in space trade-off in the sense compared to insertion only algorithms isn't very good. So if you recall, if you run the greedy algorithm in insertion only model, it uses space roughly order of n. If you want a similar space here, order of n, then we see that uh, we only get an n to the one third approximation. Um, two minus three epsilon, if you plug in one third here, we see that the approximation factor would be n to the one third. But the point is that uh, that doesn't look, you know, it's not quite as good as in the insertion only model. Um, we know that for, um, you know, linear sketch based algorithms, so the ones I sort of sketched that use only sort of sketching functions, um, we know that uh, a sketch of size n to the two minus three epsilon minus little o of one is absolutely necessary for computing an n to the epsilon approximation. So before our work, basically the state of the art is there's an upper bound that gives this n to the two minus three epsilon uh, space for an n to the epsilon approximation. And at the same time, there's an existing lower bound that says that if we only work with linear sketches, then uh, we basically need this space up to an n to the uh, little o of one term here. Question, O of one is the O of epsilon or? Uh, this little O of one, you mean? Well, is, uh, is really a constant, like 0 0.1 or? It's, I think it's a term of uh, roughly um, something like log log n over log n. Okay, so it's, okay. Good. It is depending, it depends on, and it's sort of between a, a, a polylog and a polynomial, something in between, I guess, if so you- It's, it's smaller than epsilon, in fact. It's, uh, it's smaller than epsilon, that's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, now um, the way this is proved, just to give you a bit of an idea how you prove uh, the slow bound for linear sketches, the, um, the way this done is the simultaneous communi communication model. Now in this model, um, you have k parties. Um, each party holds a subset of the edges of the input graph and each party, uh, all the parties together simultaneously send a single message to um, a referee 
the referee receives these messages and outputs a result, in our case, the matching. Now, um, the reason you can do that is uh, to, you, you can use this model for proving a lower bound for um, linear sketches based algorithms is exactly that linear sketches can be implemented in this model. Uh, the parties uh, can coordinate using public randomness and uh, you know, use a linear sketch, initialize a linear sketching function, compute their sketch locally of the edges, send the sketch to the referee. And again, the nice property of having linearity of the sketch allows the referee to combine all these sketches together and the referee can then output the result. And that's sort of, that's quite interesting because um, you can do that and somehow you get a lower bound um, uh, for sort of insertion deletion streaming algorithms or for big, you know, uh, family of algorithms for this model without even handling deletions explicitly because we only rely on the linear sketching property. And uh, the construction is also nice if, uh, if you study the details in that uh, you don't really, you have, you have basically a product distribution in the hard instances for these players. So the, there's no correlation between the inputs of the different players. So that works out really nicely and gives this lower bound. So yeah, that's, that's pretty nice. So now um, we might ask how about other, uh, other algorithms? So, so far we only looked at algorithms that compute linear sketches. So there might be other algorithms that don't rely on the computation of linear sketches. So, um, and the answer for that is a bit tricky. So um, first of all, there is a characterization result that sort of says that um, linear sketches are somewhat universal for insertion deletion um, data streaming algorithms. So informally, what these results say is that um, suppose I have an arbitrary insertion deletion streaming algorithm A, and I know that this algorithm could uh, uh, handle very, very long input streams that are in here uh, at least triple exponential in N. So the streams could potentially be extremely long. If I have such an algorithm, then I can take this algorithm and transform it into one that behaves identical to the original algorithm. So I can transform it into A prime that uses similar space uh, to the original algorithm, but it really uh, only relies on the computation of a linear sketch. So to some degree, you can transform any algorithm into one that does only linear sketches in the insertion deletion model, subject to a few constraints. One of them is that the input stream, uh, this algorithm has to be able to uh, deal with very long input streams. Now, what this basically means is um, this lower bound uh, we, that I just mentioned um, of n to the two minus three epsilon minus little of one, it also holds for streaming algorithms that are able to process very, very long streams. So to, in, in that sense, this uh, lower bound is al already sort of universal for, for insertion deletion streaming algorithms. However, so uh, we might just ask, what, what about then data streaming algorithms that rely on short input streams? What if I know that the input stream is say only of polynomial length, for example? Um, then this lower bound doesn't apply and maybe there are better algorithms. And um, that might sound at first that, you know, what holds for very long streams potentially should also hold for short streams. That could be the intuition that is given here. But then um, we know, for example, that uh, a recent result shows that um, if you restrict the length of insert deletion streams, then you can come up with a problem where linear sketching is exponentially harder than insertion deletion streaming. So there can be even an uh, exponential gap between the linear sketch size, sketch size and the streaming space complexity um, if you restrict the input stream length. So the stream length is in that sense really important. And it also shows that this uh, sort of characterization up here cannot hold for all data streaming algorithms. Christian, oh. sure. what do you mean by harder in this context? I mean, uh, harder in terms of space complexity. So exponentially harder, meaning really that the sketch that you need to compute is exponentially larger than the space uh, used by an insertion deletion streaming algorithm. Okay. Sure. Okay, so now this uh, brings us to our results. So what we prove is the following. We prove that, uh, again, every insertion deletion streaming algorithm that computes uh, n to the epsilon approximation for maximum matching does indeed require this bound n to the two minus three epsilon. So we got rid of this uh, minus little of one term here, but also um, it holds for streams that are of length order of n square. So even if the stream length is very short, um, you cannot hope to find a better algorithm than those that exist already. 
Now, the technique we use is uh, different. So recall that the other lower bound was proved in the simultaneous communication model. We um, use the more traditional one-way two-party communication model. And in this model, basically, Alice holds a set of edges, sends a single message to Bob. Now, Bob holds a set of edge deletions. So um, of course, the deletions need to be a subset of the edges that were inserted by Alice. And uh, then Bob needs to output the result. So, uh, and we use the sort of traditional connection between uh, data streaming algorithms and two-party communication uh, protocols. So, so lower bound on the, on the message here that Alice needs to send to Bob is then also lower bound on uh, the space complexity of streaming algorithms. Now, um, we also prove that um, not only this, so we basically get tight bounds for matchings, but we also get tight bounds for, vert for the vertex cover problem. So for vertex cover, our lower bound technique uh, gives uh, n to the two minus two epsilon, so even a stronger lower bound um, as for matchings, and that uh, improves over previous lower bound by n to the epsilon factor uh, for vertex cover. Okay. So um, have a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, so does it mean that uh, you can assume the deletion are arriving after the insertion? So bound? for the lower bound, you can, right? Um, we're proving a lower bound, so we only need right. to sort of uh, find sort of a hard input instance, and the instances are hard here if the deletions just are in the end and the insertions are in the beginning. That's right. Does that answer the question? Is that right? Yeah, yeah, so it answers the question. Yeah. Good, thanks. All right. Uh, um, so this is the setup um, uh, right now. So what we are going to do now is we go into the uh, actual lower bound. So we look at the maximum matching problem in the one-way two-party communication model. Um, so first of all, um, just to mention, um, the following model has already been studied. Suppose Alice has a set of edges, Bob has a different set of edges, and they jointly want to compute um, a large matching then uh, it is known that um, you can compute something really rather good. You can compute a uh, three-half approximation in this model if you know, Alice and Bob both have only edge insertions using a message of size roughly n. And this is also best possible. Like you can show that um, if you want to compute something better than a three-half approximation, then you need a little bit more space. So if we don't have deletions, this is all uh, relatively well understood. Is that question, sorry? I forgot, is this a deterministic approximation or randomized? Um, the upper bound, uh, you can get a deterministic upper bound for that, okay. but uh, the lower bound holds also for all randomized protocols. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Now, um, our model, yeah, right, maybe that's, that's an important point to mention. Um, uh, proving this result is, in to some degree, what is very nice about it, uh, the hard instances that you work with, um, there's no correlation between Alice's input and Bob's input, and that's always very useful when you prove this type of lower bound. So uh, that makes it a bit easier. The problem is, um, now we work with deletions. So our model, Alice has a set of edges, and Bob now has a set of edge deletions. But again, the deletions need to be a subset of the edges inserted by Alice. And that means um, that's nece there's necessarily a correlation between the two um, uh, inputs here. And uh, that makes it a little bit harder. Okay, now um, let me show uh, you how we actually do it then in the end. Um, so first we work with a um, communication problem. We introduce a problem or an extension of the uh, so-called augmented index communication problem to two dimensions. And the version we work with, um, we, we call it uh, the B index or by index problem. So it's parameterized by two variables, n and k. And in this problem, so Alice holds a n by n binary matrix A. Uh, and then Bob holds uh, a, an index basically. So a position in this binary matrix, which is described by a, a x and a y coordinate. And we want these x and y coordinates to be in a sort of in a sub uh, square of or sub yeah, in a submatrix of the, the big matrix A. So we have a position in this matrix, and in addition to that, Bob also holds sort of an incomplete submatrix, which is defined like this, but a, a picture is, um, is much better to show what we mean. So um, uh, here's the n by n matrix that Alice holds. Bob holds uh, a position, so that would be the in, uh, position that we're interested in, AXY. 
And beside this position, uh, Bob holds uh, incomplete submatrix, which is this AS of XY, and that would be sort of the area um, enclosed by this dashed line. So this is a submatrix, and it's uh, it's almost a submatrix. It's sort of incomplete because this position here is missing. Bob doesn't know what this position is, and of course, this will be exactly what the problem is about. Bob needs to output exactly this position that is missing. So Bob holds the submatrix with this position basically missing in here. Now, um, to uh, for this problem to make sense, of course the you know, the, um, since this is a K by K submatrix, um, the coordinate X, Y has to be in the interval N minus K square. So it can only come from this shaded area. Otherwise, sort of, you know, the submatrix would be too far, you know, there would, wouldn't be space to know all uh, about this entire submatrix. Now there is, uh, of course, a very trivial um, communication protocol for this problem. Um, Alice simply is gonna send um, this area here. This is a, this area of size n minus k square, where this position might, where x, y might lie in and just send this directly. So we know that the uh, randomized communication complexity of this problem is at most n minus k squared. Uh, I hope this problem definition makes sense. Please uh, interrupt me if it's, if it's not quite clear. Um, so uh, it's not too hard to see that actually this n minus k square is not only an upper bound, but it's a lower bound as well. So the way to prove this, that the uh, um, randomized one-way communication complexity of this problem is n minus k square, is a low bound as well, is you can basically do a reduction to the traditional augmented index problem. So in the traditional augmented index problem, um, Alice holds uh, just a bit vector of length um, capital N here. Bob knows a position L in this, uh, a position N in uh, L in this vector V. But in addition to that, also knows uh, the suffix vector. That is, uh, Bob knows, is interested in VL, but knows uh, the suffix VL plus one to VN. So everything that comes after this specific position. And it's uh, very well known that this has a lower bound of omega of N. And now uh, to see the connection between these problems, um, you can basically do the following. Um, so suppose we have such an index problem to solve. So um, we um, take an index problem of dimension of size n minus k square. Then Alice can just pretend that the vector that she has um, uh, of this length n minus k square I could just put the entries of v here into a matrix, into basically a submatrix of a much bigger matrix. And Alice could fill the rest basically with zeros in this matrix. Then we see that this uh, forms the right input for our by index problem here. Could, uh, Alice could just compute whatever messages to send in the by index problem to Bob. Now Bob, basically we can see that Bob knows also the right input for the by index problem. So if you recall in the by index problem, Bob needs to know everything that's in this uh, area enclosed by this dashed line. And we see that, um, you know, we're interested in V13. Bob knows uh, by the uh, augmented index problem, knows everything that comes after it. So Bob knows V14 up to V25. So Bob knows sort of the green area. So Bob knows in particular everything that's in here. And the rest of the uh, entries is zero anyway. So Bob basically knows about that. And you can use this connection to uh, get an optimal lower bound of n minus k square for the by index problem. Okay, so by index problem is basically an extension of the traditional augmented index problem to two dimensions, uh, you know, a particular extension that has this uh, um, specific knowledge for Bob. Okay, and now what we're going to do is we use this uh, by index problem to prove, um, to form a reduction um, to the maximum matching problem. So that works as follows. So we prove that any n to the epsilon approximation two-party communication protocol for matchings with deletions has this communication cost of n to the two minus three epsilon. Hello. Yep. Oui. Oui, Michel. Uh, sorry, I think I can't hear hear the question. No, I think maybe it's a, a phone call. Maybe I'll be <laughs> right. Now. Okay, that's fine. No worries. Okay, so here's what we do. So um, we pick an instance of the by index problem, and we are going to show that if we are given a communication protocol for maximum matching with deletions, then we can solve the by index problem. 
So again, in the bindex problem, we have a binary matrix that Alice holds, that's this matrix A. And we have this position X, Y that Bob holds, and Bob also has this submatrix, um, this incomplete submatrix A uh, subscript a, uh, S of X, Y. Uh, and suppose that um, P is a protocol for maximum matching with deletions. Now, what Alice does is the following. So first of all, Alice and Bob sort of use um, shared uh, public randomness and they sample a uniform random binary matrix X. So uh, that's just, you know, completely random binary matrix X. Next, um, so Alice knows A. Alice now knows as well X because that's from public randomness. So they can compute um, the entry-wise X or to get a matrix A prime. So every bit is basically flipped off this matrix A with probability one half. Um, next, uh, Alice can interpret this uh, matrix A prime as the incidence matrix of a bipartite graph. So on one dimension, we have the A vertices, on the other dimension, we have the B vertices. And uh, so this um, gives us a bipartite graph and Alice then simply runs um, our matching um, protocol, algorithm for matching on um, this matrix A prime, which generates some, some mes message mu that is being sent to Bob. So again, the important observation is that now the graph G that we constructed that way is a random bipartite graph where every edge is simply included with probability one half. So observe that no matter what the actual input graph A is, if you sort of flip every bit with probability one half, so you XO with this matrix X, then you get um, a bipartite random graph basically. Okay, then, um, so Bob uh, receives this message mu from Alice and um, yeah, so recall that Orb knows this incomplete submatrix of this matrix A in our problem. Um, Bob also knows the matrix X that we use uh, sample from uh, public randomness. So Bob knows also this sort of A prime um, subscript S of X, Y, this incomplete submatrix in A prime. And now here's what uh, Bob does. So Bob knows this, uh, this area, this blue area, that's this A prime of, um, that we got here, this part of the big matrix A prime. Now there are some diagonal entries in here. Now in particular, you see that, you know, we're interested and our goal would be still would be to identify the top left coordinate. We don't know about that. So um, Bob doesn't know what this value really is. But Bob knows um, all the other diagonal entries here. In fact, Bob knows basically all the, the entries in the submatrix. Now what Bob does is Bob deletes all these off diagonal ones that we have in here. So Bob basically, uh, continuous, if you if you like, um, um, yeah, inserts basically deletions into the the stream or you know yeah, as the input for the matching problem and deletes all the ones that are on the off diagonal here. So that what we're left with is in this matrix is um, basically if we have ones, then they have to be on the diagonal in the sub matrix. Everything else will be zero in here. Now, um, just. Uh, um, at this stage, it's very useful to um, see how we choose the parameters here. So if we recall this matrix in here was a K by K matrix. Now we are going to use a value for K that is basically N minus something little O of N, some uh, N minus um, uh, theta of N to the one minus epsilon. And basically think about this K or the sub matrix to be really, really large. So uh, this, the sub matrix is basically almost the size of the entire matrix up to a low order term. Because then um, we see that we have the following properties. Um, if we compute a matching inside of this area, you know, recall that we removed basically, we, um, we don't have any entries, any one entries in here and in here. So the only matching that we've got would be along the diagonal. And uh, we know that since we've um, sort of flipped every bit with probability one half, um, if this is of size K, then we should expect a matching of size uh, K half in here. And uh, so the expected size of a matching in here is um, K half. Uh, using this choice of parameter, the matching in here is really large. So we expect a matching of size N half minus little of N in here. Now, a matching outside this area of this uh, submatrix here, so a matching outside here, uh, cannot be large because, uh, you know, simply this uh, rectangle is really, really big. So outside, there's not much space left. So a matching outside, if you compute this, you would see that this is at most of size n to the one minus epsilon. So there's a large matching and there's only a small matching on the outside. And that means that any protocol or algorithm that reports, um, you know, since our approximation ratio is n to the epsilon, we know there's a matching in the graph of size, say, theta of n, 
um, there's not a large matching outside the submatrix. We need to report necessarily many, many edges from uh, um, this matching in the diagonal here. We need to but report in particular n to the one minus epsilon many. Sorry? Christian, outside of M, why, I mean, don't we have something even stronger that there is no matching bigger than n to the epsilon? If, if, if K is, I uh, know it's it's just the difference between n and and k. Yeah, you see, the like um, rows and the number of rows that are outside of m, they mm. just keep the matching. Okay, okay, pardon, pardon. Makes sense. Yeah, my yes, you're right. right. Yes. They're into the one minus epsilon uh, vertices outside, basically. Yeah, you're right. right. Okay, so um, now we know that an algorithm needs to report uh, many many ones of this diagonal. Now, uh, that's just a repetition of this fact that I just stated. Um, if we assume the following two properties, so we see how to get rid of these later. First, we assume that the matching M prime that is output by the algorithm is in fact just a completely random subset of this diagonal, which it obviously won't be, but let's assume that it would be a uniform random subset of the one entries in this diagonal. And of course it has to be of size N to the one minus epsilon that comes from the approximation factor. Let's assume also that this entry on the top left here, uh, the one we're interested in, is a one actually. Uh, if that's the case, then we're basically already done to get our lower bound. And the reason is simply, you know, it means that this one here uh, is, a, is an actual edge of the matching and it would be reported with probability one over n to the epsilon. Recall that there are basically, there's a matching of size a theta of n. We have to report n to the one minus epsilon of them. Then the probability to report this one would be uh, one over n to the epsilon. And uh, that means we could just repeat our protocol um, order of n to the epsilon times. And uh, then with high enough or constant probability, we would report this one here and we're done basically. And if you do the maths, you see that um, using uh, our parameters, where, you know, the, this, uh, the choice of K, we would see exactly that, you know, repeating the protocol at, um, uh, n to the epsilon times um, solves the die index problem. The die index problem would have this lower bound of n to the two minus two epsilon. So we know that sort of the message has to be of size at least n to the two minus three epsilon, which is exactly what we what we want. So it's really about getting rid of these two assumptions here. Um, so how can we do that? So this seems to be a rather strong assumption that the matching is a random subset of the diagonal uh, entries of the diagonal ones. So um, how do we get rid of these? So the first assumption or the easy one is, you know, we assume that the bit that we're interested in is exactly one. But that's not really hard to establish because um, if you recall, we flipped every bit with probability one half. So we have anyway a chance of one half that this bit is exactly one and not zero. So we just increase the number of parallel runs by a factor of two and then basically half of the time we will have this bit to be one. So that would be good anyway. Um, the other assumption um, that M prime is a random subset of uh, M um, is a bit, you know, is we can get rid of this assumption in a different way. So what we do is um, recall that we said A prime, the matrix we work with is the original matrix A, but with, with an XOR, we XOR it with a random binary matrix. Now, what we do in, in the paper to get rid of this assumption is we work instead with a matrix A double prime. Uh, which is obtained from A prime by sort of independently permuting the rows and the columns of uh, A prime. So this has some, some interesting implications. So for example, this square that I nicely presented in this, these graphics where Bob basically holds the submatrix is not anymore really sort of a sub square, but it's more a combinatorial rectangle in, in this matrix A pr uh, double prime. Sorry, and these but permutations the are also random, right? They are completely random, yeah, and chosen independently from each other. You're right. And uh, we see that, um, you know, in A double prime, um, uh, no matter which sort of um, what corresponds to the original diagonal, <clears throat> which ones you output, you know, you have to output basically edges which correspond to one entries due to the permutations, they might have originated from any position on this diagonal. And since everything is random, this randomness basically means that indeed every um, one from this original diagonal would be um, output with the same probability. So every edge is therefore equally likely to be included in the output M prime. And this basically eliminates this assumption that we get a random subset of M or in, or in other words, we can indeed 
uh, establish the property that a random subset would be presented. And this, this already completely uh, describes the entire proof. So it is, uh, um, in that sense, um, I think it's quite a simple proof uh, for, for this specific result. Okay, now um, uh, I have, I get, you know, we're running a bit low on time. So um, there is, we have similar results for minimum vertex cover. So I just um, gonna um, quickly mention one aspect of this result. So um, interestingly, the same technique that you've just seen for matching works for minimum vertex cover as well. However, it's even easier. So we don't need, in this case, we don't need to repeat the protocol into the epsilon times, but only uh, order of one times. And that's why we get sort of a lower bound, which is n square minus two epsilon for this problem. Interestingly as well, it's really easy to find a deterministic uh, insertion deletion streaming algorithm for vertex cover that basically matches this um, space bound up to log factor. And interestingly, this algorithm is in fact deterministic despite me saying earlier that you, know, you basically always need randomization for insertion deletion um, streaming algorithms. The reason is here that a vertex cover sort of outputs um, you know, vertices as opposed to edges and outputting edges in insertion deletion streams is much harder than outputting vertices. So there's a bit of a difference between these two things. Okay, then um, uh, to summarize, um, so this work basically gave optimal lower bounds for matching and minimum vertex cover approximations in the one-way two-party setting. And it sort of settles now the space complexity of streaming algorithms for both problems really in a relatively strong way in that not only the space is basically optimal, but also um, uh, it holds for streaming algorithms that pros, you know, that rely on very short streams. And uh, yeah, I think it's it's potentially the last, uh, the, you know, it's the optimal result in this um, for this question. Open problems. Um, uh, there is a, you know, it seems relatively difficult to get a matching lower bound for maximum matching if you are guaranteed that the input graph described by the stream is a sparse graph then uh, somehow the techniques don't translate. Similar, um, there are many, many questions open. What about matching size estimation in, uh, as opposed to actually outputting the matching? And uh, yeah, before I finish, I'd also like to say that there will be um, a postdoc position available and um, that's in a, in a project uh, that addresses um, streaming algorithms for massive uh, insertion deletion streams, basically for massive dynamic graphs. So that would be a two-year postdoc position and would probably start this year in October. And there are a few partners involved as well. So I think it's, uh, it would be quite exciting to work on that. And yeah, um, thanks for your attention. <laughs>